I am dedicating this talk to the memory of Annetta Pedretti. Uh, Annetta wrote her PhD thesis, The Cybernetics of Language, under Gordon Pask in 1981, and she ever and always was in the discussion of the making of a distinction, and that was not just the theme of her thesis, but was the exploration behind her work in cybernetics, description and meta description, architecture, design, publishing, art, and the design and practice of beekeeping. She was born in Switzerland in 1954 and passed away in London in, 19, in 2018. Um, this is a picture of the cover of the thesis, which she published herself in her Prinsulid Editions uh, uh, book, book publishing adventure. Um, I thought I would give her a few, th few words to begin the talk. These are a couple of excerpts from the thesis. Um, I won't read all of it. I just will read a little bit of it. But in trying to speak about language, I found that I had to remove distinctions successive distinctions, excessive distinctions. We seem to think it pointless to remove distinctions. If there is perhaps a point in saying the things I say, it is as the naive child protesting about the cumbersome ways grown-ups have of going about things, cumbersome ways which a St. Cupery, the child found to make such grown-ups blind to the simplicity of things when he drew his uh, drawing number one. It was a picture of a boa constrictor digesting an elephant. I don't need to read the rest. Um, about things. In constructing, uh, the observer and his construction are one and cannot be distinguished. I'll leave it at that and take you to the end of Laws of Form where Spencer Brown says, we see now that the first distinction, the mark and the observer, are not only interchangeable, but in the form identical. Uh, this is a, a kind of sentence that Spencer Brown wrote, which um, sometimes is looked at and seen as a, a very mystical statement, uh, but uh, it can also be the most concrete thing that you could say about language and the observer uh, as well. and. Uh, and those modalities uh, uh, all interact uh, as you read laws of form again and again, or think about these matters again and again. Um, next topic. Um, this is about part of the work of Varela, Maturana, and Uribe in their well-known paper on autopoiesis. And what they did was uh, they took a, uh, uh, an abstract chemical substrate uh, a catalyst star, which um, uh, if it has some uh, chemical neighbors, which I'll just call circles, combines to become uh, neighbors that can be bound together. And the binding can occur over time. Uh, there is decay. Uh, all of these recursive constructions that I mention, as I will mention many recursive constructions as we go along, um, fit Dirk's principles very well about uh, form and decay. You can think about that in relation to this. The, the ones that can bind uh, decay uh, after some time back into the ordinary ones. And so what happens when you uh, begin with a catalyst in, in a soup like that is that the bindings begin to form uh, in the neighborhood of the catalyst and naturally out of the geometry of the situation the bindings form a circle and become a boundary which creates a protocell uh, out of the distinctions that are present. So that a new distinction arises, the new distinctions arise, the protocells with their boundaries, out of other forms of distinction that are present in the substrate. So this is the process uh, of autopoiesis that they illustrated here and it is a very interesting and important image about how distinctions arise from distinctions in the course of recursion and in the course of this kind of construction. You can make modern versions of this. Um, so in the model, the elemental distinctions interact to produce a new distinction, the protocell in the plane that maintains its distinctive structure in the course of the recursion of the molecular interactions. Of course, 
when you start to look at models like this, you, you feel like, oh, well, I, I, don't, I don't want maybe to start with a whole collection <laughs> of pre-processed distinctions to begin with. Why shouldn't all the distinctions be arising? And, um, and then you find yourself exploring further to see whether that might be the case. And in any case, in the making of a distinction, the distinction was not there until it was made. You may draw a circle in a tied flattened stretch of sand. You may draw a distinction on the blackboard. You may draw one in the air. It wasn't there until you made it, and it can disappear again. Um, in the same sense, uh, a system where there are some specific kinds of interactions can draw such a distinction, and that's what you see in these models, which of course require more thought. And uh, I can't resist the, the natural thought that comes from looking at this bit of, you might say, artificial life. You would like to create a next level from some simple way of stating a principle and allowing it to go for the interactions of the protocells. But I think that uh, that's not obvious here, what the next step should be. Uh, and we're down at the very beginnings of artificial life, historically and otherwise. And I'm certainly not going to start talking about other automata that produce what people call artificial life. Um, then another aspect of recursion are beautiful self-similar geometric forms that emerge from very simple distinctions and recursive processes involved. Um, and we know these, but I feel like putting them putting some of the pictures in front of us. Um, <laughs> like this is some, some depth search into the Mandelbrot set, some particular thing. And, um, and the rules that are behind this are deeply, uh, are very simple. Uh, they're just uh, multiplying complex numbers, just squaring something, adding something. Uh, uh, but the form you get is uh, extremely complex uh, and cryptic. And uh, you, would, you would look at it and try to describe it and find yourself uh, at sea in, in some uh, form of observation. Uh, uh, how is that connected with the rules that generated it? Uh, you know how it is by the program, but how, is it, how can you make a connection with that in a more direct way? I don't know. Um, Higher dimensional analogs of these kind of recursions give us some insight into nature of space and time. I can think of geometries sprouting out of geometries and so on, just ideas I care to mention, or uh, the kind of um, recursions and beautiful geometries that come out of uh, things in biological systems. But I want to talk about things that are as simple as possible, and there we will find ourselves back looking at laws of form. Um, uh, what is the nature of a distinction? That's the question. And in a mathematical sense, there's no definition. Because a definition in mathematics is a certain form of distinction. And Spencer Brown begins self-referentially he says, we take the idea of distinction, we take as given the idea of distinction, and that one cannot make an indication without drawing a distinction. We take, therefore, the form of distinction for the form. And then on those first pages of Laws of Form, you find the, word, the words about distinction and definition, such as uh, definition, Distinction is perfect continence, but that's not a definition in the mathematical sense. It's circular, and it is a statement of a word for distinction, definition, and then some other words which you can interpret as you will. And uh, the first page goes on like a dictionary of many words for distinction placed in some forms that have the appearance of English sentences, as you know. Um, uh, what is the nature of a distinction? In your interaction with a something in your world, you find that you make many distinctions. And I've chosen a few images that, are, uh, that I happen to like for the way in which one interacts visually, making one distinction and then another and then another and then another in these forms. 
Now this is a Necker computer register. Every Necker cube is either forward or back, right? <laughs> Moves from state to state. And, um, and here is imaginary value in the visual form. There is no cube. It's virtual, entirely virtual. There are only some small, oh, I can't do that. <laughs> there are only some small arrows up near the black, uh, bump, bumping into the black circles. Uh, the cube is, is something you made, for sure. And you, it's a Necker cube, and you can see it either way. You, know, uh, uh, you notice that, if you care to stare at it a little bit longer. Um, uh, or here. Or here. Uh, or here. Um, this artist is relying on something <coughs> hidden in your brain or hidden in your perception and also here. So you are making all of those distinctions in interaction with some things that are perhaps given. Uh, what's the nature of a distinction? We make distinctions or we imagine that we make distinctions. A circle makes a distinction in the plane between its inside and its outside. We draw a circle and so make a distinction. Finding a circle, we agree that it is a distinction. We see that the circle makes a difference between its inside and its outside. We see that for us, the circle indicates a difference between its inside and its outside. A circle could be a symbol standing for a distinction. A circle could be a symbol. It could be written outside the circle of the original distinction and become its name. The symbol can make a distinction with our help. A symbol can be the name. And in the primordial event of a distinction, that is the, in a firstness, the distinction is its own name. So in Spencer Brown's Laws of Form, these, these remarks uh, crystallize into the laws of calling and the, laws of, and the law of crossing. In the law of calling, each circle can be regarded as the name of the other, and so erased. And in the law of crossing, you cross from the state indicated by the mark to the unmarked state. Spencer Brown's calculus is inherently self-referential. The mark stands for a distinction and can be seen to stand for the distinction made by the mark itself. The mark is a sign for itself in the sense of Charles Sanders Peirce. And one could stay there and um, think semiotically for a long time without making any calculi. I think that is a very interesting place. Um, we know that this goes on into a mathematical form. But if you're only thinking about the properties of signs and indications, as Peirce was in his talking about that kind of thing, then you can stay here and, and notice that you really do have a sign for itself, which looked like the end of a huge recursion in the way Peirce talked about it. But this sign is simply a sign for itself, there and there alone. And one can think about that, play with that. And then the law of crossing. I wanted to express it in a few lines this way. A distinction fitting into itself recognizes that what it is is identical with what it is not, and so the distinction disappears. Primordial distinction is its own name. I included this slide, and then I realized on talking with uh, Tom Post that he's talking about um, uh, Douglas Harding's notion that you have no head. Uh, the singularity for you as, a, as an observer in the space is not over here, like in Escher's picture. The singularity is here. Um, and it's strange to view Escher's picture as a displacement of Douglas Harding's absent head. Uh, strange enough so that some mathematicians got hold of this picture of Escher and decided to fill in the void with a, uh, 
a fractal reenactment of the entire picture within itself and make a movie of it, which I won't show you. But uh, it's available. You may find it somewhere. Um, we may begin with distinctions that describe other distinctions, but they soon will be describing themselves. Now, I want to talk about a specific thing. Uh, this is a, uh, a specific model, like the autopoiesis model, due to Joel Isaacson, about recursive distinguishing. And it's very simple. Um, and what's surprising about it is that how much, it, how much comes out of it, given its simplicity. You, s you begin with um, a row of letters. And you look at each letter, and you ask whether it is the same or different from the letters on either side of it. And if it is equal to the letters on either side of it, you put underneath the letter an equal sign. If it is equal to the one on the left and unequal to the one on the right, you put a bar, a little vertical bar, on your equal sign on the right to indicate different. And you put a little vertical bar on the left if it's different on the left. And if it's different in both cases, I sometimes draw a circle or a little box. So, oops. so let's recurse here and see what happens. I used a circle instead of a box to indicate different. So I started with a, a little field of, um, of entities with one singularity in the middle, one distinction in the middle. B is distinct from the A's on either side of it. And now we perform the description of the distinction. So the observer who is doing this from, our, uh, from using Dirk's language as a second order observer, he is examining the distinctions that the uh, previous characters make. And all the A's up to a point are equal to their neighbors. And then we come to an A which is unequal to the B that is on its uh, right from my point of view. And you get a bracket going that way. And then you have B, which is unequal to its neighbors. And then you have A, which is equal to its right neighbor. And you get another bracket and then lots of equal signs. And now we do it again, because we're going to do this again and again. And whatever you start with, you end up with just the icons. And then the icons are recursing on themselves. So you can start with anything. And then you begin uh, with a series of icons. And the icons are made out of indicators for the distinctions that the previous icons made. In fact, you can think of the upper and lower parts as saying it's different from the outside. Um, so at the next stage, all the A's are equal up to a point, but then we bump into, uh, we, I'm sorry, the equal signs are all equal up to a point, and then we bump into an equal sign which uh, has uh, somebody different on, the, on, on his right, and a bracket occurs. And then we have unequal, 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 and then another bracket, and then all equal signs. It opened up a little. And then we go again, and this time uh, we get um, this bracket, circle bracket form, and then we get an equals, a kind of space between them, and another bracket, circle bracket form. So you, get, you, you gave birth to a form on the first line, and then that form opened itself up a little bit and reproduced itself on the next line. So one of the very first things that happens from a singularity or a distinction in this model is the birth of a something which can reproduce itself. Uh, that seems to be a lot for, uh, from very little. And so I recommend thinking about this model <laughs> for that reason. Um, single distinction. This, I said everything I, I just said here. Yeah, mitosis occurred. Um, here's a more complicated arrangement. Um, now we're in two dimensions, and each of these funny little symbols is the icon. The icon, with a, the icon that's a full box says, I'm different from all my neighbors, from the previous time, not necessarily right now. And the one that looks like a ma laws of form mark says, I'm different from this, and I'm different from this, but I'm equal to that, and I'm equal to that. And as you see, you'll get more laws of form marks all over the place in different orientations. You also get some single lines, and you will get blank. There are 16 of them in this alphabet. The icons become a 16 uh, icon alphabet. And this is something that happened after cursing for a long time. It, um, in, in the next step, it becomes this. And in the next step, becomes this, it's order two. Each of these two 
complex forms describes the other one. A many, uh, many such periodic forms will arise in the course of your playing with this if you did it by hand or with a computer. Um, not necessarily order two, but order two came up um, kind of frequently. It would go on and on and on, and then, oh, it's oscillating between these two entities that describe each other. Hmm? Um, so um, there's, a, there's a, uh, a, uh, an arena for some exploration, and uh, we've been playing with that. Um, we imagine more complex in examples of interaction. For example, you can consider a co any conversation and how each person transforms the language of the other in, in a sequence of recursive moves, and I think that's not such a good choice of language since I don't want to think about recursive moves. Um, at this point, I'm go I told you that I would worry about my time. Uh, so I'm going to uh, quickly skip across some slides, and if I see one that I want to make a comment on, I, I'll say something. Russell's paradox in the diagrammatic form of a curl curling on itself. A set curling on itself and becoming an eigenform for uh, membership, a set belonging to itself. Uh, DNA uh, is knotted and can undergo recursion, and the DNA recursion looks like this. Uh, a Watson and a Crick strand in, opened up by the environment, opened up into the environment by enzyme action the environment provides a, a, um, a, a, a Crick strand to Watson and a Watson strand to Crick, and the DNA replicates, which is very similar to the replication form here, where the little protocell opened up, and then the environment, as it were, supplied the, the ingredients for making two of them. Uh, now we're at the last point. And I want to talk about what comes from the reentry, the infinite reentry form, or the process of reentry that we're familiar with. You have the reentering mark, and you keep reentering it and evaluating across time, or you get the spatial eigenform. It's the cross time part that I want to think about. If you just looked at what got entered, you see you have mark state, then you have mark state within it, mark state within it. And these alternate, of course, between marked and unmarked because each time the marked state goes in, it vanishes, and then it appears again. The re-entering mark is an imaginary value in Spencer Brown's discussion of imaginary value, where there is some temporality and a something at a given time creates a change that moves it to something that happens at the next time. In his discussion of imaginary value, he points to internal workings of his circuits and says, here, here the imaginary value operates. And if you look into those circuits, you see that it meant that at just the right time in the action of the circuit, a mark appeared which was able to influence, as though the circuit uh, observed itself, the transition to a next state, and then maybe that mark disappeared. So the reentering mark is, is the, an exemplar of that kind of imaginary value, and we perhaps overstudy it, but that's what I'm doing here. Um, so I'm, I'm using zero for the marked state, one for the unmarked state, and there is the oscillation. And then I wish to look at it as two views, the view that it is oscillating from zero to one, P, and the view that is oscillating from one to zero, Q. And I wish to think of P and Q not necessarily as static entities, but also as time-sensitive entities. And if P is time-sensitive and it interacts with P, then it takes a moment for P to interact with P, and one of the P's ends up becoming a Q, because in time, P and Q go back and forth to one another. P becomes Q, Q becomes P. The time shift the time frame shifts from 0, 1 to 1, 0, from 0, 1 to 1, 0. So that P as a time-sensitive entity act, interacts with itself as P interacting with Q. But if P interacts with Q point to point, you have 0 interacting with 1 and 1 interacting with 0. You have 0, 0. You have the marked state only. Um, and so we can make time 
sensitive entities by adding another symbol. Sorry for a lot of mathematics at the very end. Um, the symbol is non-commutative. On one side of something, it, it, you will see the something, a, b, and the symbol, eta. And, uh, and if you shift eta across, time happens, and you turn it into b, a. So eta on both sides of a, b becomes b, a. a, b becomes time sensitive by, I'll, uh, I'll stop by finishing my little talk here for a minute. The, so u and u star are the time sensitive versions of p and q. And then you can calculate the, uh, an algebraic pattern that comes out of the recursion. If you let u interact with itself, you see p flips to q, as I said. And q interacting with p is 0. Um, on the other hand, if you let u interact with u star, uh, y then uh, the uh, q gets flipped to a p and you get p. u u star is p itself, u star u is q itself, and u u star plus u star u is p plus q, which is just 1 1, which is 1. So you have this pattern, u squared is 0, u star squared is 0, and u u star plus u star u is equal to 1. That is the algebra uh, usually associated with a fermion particle. So we see that this kind of pattern is coming up out of very nearly nothing, just the distinction and uh, the oscillation. I have not used any higher forms of arithmetic. I haven't used plus 1 or minus 1. I'm just using the, the mark. Um, let's skip that slide uh, and skip this one, but point out this one. This is the kind of distinction we just uh, discovered. Uh, an upstate, a downstate are getting interchanged by u and u star. The crossing now has a directionality. You go from upstate to downstate by u or u star, but you, can't, you have to use the right one because if you use the wrong one, you go to the void. So this is a special kind of distinction near the first distinction uh, that we've been talking about that comes out of the oscillation. And you might write it in terms of a containment calculus where you have a couple of new ones, left and right ones, and they are square roots of negation, similar in a way to what uh, Art Collings made with one square root of negation, and they interact um, non-commutatively. Um, I want to make the final remark that if we now go to arithmetic, we're taking another step up, and it's quite different. And what happens in arithmetic? In arithmetic, you have plus 1 and minus 1, and you think minus is negation. But in arithmetic, 0 is in the middle, and minus 0 is 0. So 0 is self-referential. 0 is like the re-entering mark. You, when you go up to arithmetic, you're actually going up into um, a calculus of imaginary values from the point of view of laws of form. It's a big step. Arithmetic is way, beyond, way up here, quite a distance from, uh, from just the 0 and the 1. And yet, if we accept arithmetic, and play the game, then we could take the difference between p and q, and we would have the oscillation between minus 1 and 1, and we would land on the square root of minus 1 and other algebras that are also related uh, to physics. But I must stop. <laughs>
thought of in that way as the unmarked state is the whole, and the marked state is as particularity, locality, and partness. Yeah. Yes. I, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, that's fine. But, but um, yeah, that complement of where we can go with mathematics, but also where we can't go with mathematics alongside, uh, and that in some sense the system can express itself um, in, in a kind of irreducible wholeness, an irreducible quality. Uh, that that um, that doesn't go express it through the parts, but expresses the whole. And in exploring, we are often uh, looking at parts and trying to get them back into the whole. Instead of swallowing the elephant, we're trying to find out whether it is an elephant. Other comments? Yeah. Um, I know you skipped over this slide um, when you were freaking out about the time. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm really curious about, uh, I don't know if I saw a slide on the indicative shift or, uh, or the way you used, because um, I remember you had a- Certainly uh, there are slides on the indicative shift, whether I kept them in here, I don't think, oh, I did. Yeah, right, right. right. There. Yeah, right. Well, that, that's not quite it. Okay. I, yeah, no matter. Um, let's talk about the indicative shift, yes. Yeah. Um, just because I know you have a proof for the incompleteness theorem, that I remember the first time we met, that was something that was on my mind, and something that I've been working on, and you know, seeing you do it in like half a page, it was kind <laughs> of <laughs> um, amazing. So I don't know if you wanted to talk about that. Um, well, the, all of these things have this kind of pattern that if you, uh, or maybe this will, this will help, right? I have this entity, uh, gremlin over here, uh, which when it interacts with A, duplicates A and puts it in a box. And that's uh, innocuous enough, just duplicates A and puts it in a box. But, uh, but if, if a gremlin meets a gremlin, then the gremlin uh, makes two copies of a gremlin and puts it in a box. And now we have two copies of a gremlin interacting with one another, and they will do it again, being gremli. And, uh, and so this goes on forever. It, it sits inside itself, or, or it does the recursion. So this, this curious notational thing is is fundamentally related to the idea of a reflexive domain where every element in the domain can interact with every other element in the domain to produce a new element of the domain. That is to say, every element of the domain is a transformation of the domain. And we have no stops on what constitutes an entity. I, I, if I am an entity and you are an entity, then we, in conversation, become an entity. We become one of Dirk's catchings. And, and it goes on forever. Uh, in that way, and the, and the, the domain in, uh, is full of self-interaction and interaction with others. And then, and then this sort of thing can happen, of course, because the entity can interact with itself. A new entity can be the one that does something with the self-interaction. And so fixed points will occur. Eigenforms will occur. They are just part and parcel of reflexivity. And then uh, things like Gödel's theorem and 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 shifts of self-reference are, are actually formally very similar to this. And uh, rather than change formalisms in midstream, I'll, I'll just stay with this. But we can talk about the other things. Yeah. Uh, lambda, lambda calculus, lambda calculus yeah, yeah. yes. This is, this is a uh, tiny course in lambda calculus, that slide, yeah. But do you think about, what do you think about the function applying to itself in undiluted lambda? Uh, I'm sorry, didn't. The, the function that applies to itself? Yeah, that, so they're, they're, yeah that, that's given, right, uh, as part of the situation that an x can interact with itself, yes. So, so of course, uh, uh, that uh, from the 
from that la later point of view, long after the Principia Mathematica and Russell's paradox and so on, when Church and Curry began to think about these kind of things, they said, well, we'll allow it. We'll allow things to interact with themselves and, and produce domains in which this could happen. And then there are many mathematical difficulties with such domains, but it's very natural. And computer people think it's very natural because if you write a program, you could certainly let it interact with other programs and you can give it a name. So, um, so the, what is the difficulty? The, the difficulty seems to be that uh, mathematicians have a, have a passion for putting everything into an internal category. And, uh, and then things that are fundamentally temporal don't fit very well into eternal categories. And so then we get lots of uh, interesting technical work to do because of that. If, um, in order to define what a distinction is, you say it's hard to describe. Oh, oh, I say you couldn't possibly make a definition of a distinction. You could only indicate uh, something about it and, uh, and, and explore. What is not a distinction? What is its complement? I, I cannot say. <laughs> Uh, I can say. I mean, a, a, a domain in which there is no uh, uh, no no distinction between things. I mean, you may have things which are distinct, but there's no distinction between them. Like these are both hands of mine, but they are distinct. They're one's left and one's right. Maxwell um, had an expression that uh, a thing, what a thing is and what it is not, are the same thing. You know, that that's yeah. Maxwell's version of the law of crossing. In yeah. fact, right. Yeah. Uh, that the, the, the distinction, I mean, that's what's beautiful about laws of form. It goes backward and forward. The, the, f the form of distinction fitting into itself removes the distinction because the, the, that seam could just disappear. Right. I don't know whether that sort of helps answer. Yeah, that was fine. It doesn't. <laughs> or, or other people speak about it in other ways, like um, some people speak of the Godhead as a place where there's no distinction. All things are are, pro, are potent, but not present. Thank you. Hmm. Yeah. The um, recursive distinction examples you gave were fascinating because you're taking a kind of static entity and you're unfolding it to show the complementary dynamics. That yes, that's, that's right. So, so one is taking a, a, a situation where there's a definite a collection of relationships which are indicated by distinct which can be indicated by distinctions and then making a new field of entities which are made out of the very distinctions that uh, were present in the in the earlier part so if we were to speak about how we converse of course it, it seems to be described by that but it's more complex than than that and in some ways may be more simple than that so it's a model, and uh, from my point of view, it's not everything, but it's a very interesting model. So in some sense, are you uncovering the icon form that gives rise to that entity? Or yes. Yeah. The, right. I, eigen forms, one tends to think of eigen forms as um, things like, uh, like infinitely many boxes, where if you put one more around it, it doesn't change. And that's a uh, generalization, of course, of eigenvalue, where one wasn't always re making recursions to find the eigenvalues. But one also wasn't always making recursions to make the eigenform, such as I am the one who says I places I as an eigenform, but it isn't that I is always thinking about I forever. Um, or in Dirk's Katjeks, uh, the, the organization uh, is is working in relation to itself, but it doesn't have to go to infinity uh, in the mathematical sense, and you probably wouldn't want it to. On the other hand, you walk in front of a two facing mirrors and it effectively physically creates an infinity for you. Yeah? Well, what if you have an example, like uh, you have a speaker and a microphone and then you generate feedback, but 
feedback will uh, infinitely sort of explode unless you have something that's containing it. Like, so it wouldn't, you wouldn't get a decay, but you would right. get like a, an right. explosion sort of. Sure, so as soon as you have feedback, you have the question of whether it would be uncontrolled or controlled, positive and negative, and all those issues. Right. right. Well, when we're talking of eigenvalue or eigenform, is there, uh, in relation to explosion or decay or sort of stasis or fixed pointness? Um, well, it depends on what you mean by explode, right? Uh, if I point the mic uh, back at the speaker and the sound is being amplified beyond my uh, endurance, then I will say, oh, this is uncontrolled feedback. But, um, uh, but, uh, but, but uh, if I just think about it abstractly, um, it, it's just it's doing what it's doing. So uh, in The Sorcerer's Apprentice, uh, the, uh, there was uncontrolled feedback from the point of view of, uh, of Mickey Mouse. <laughs> Um, and controlled by the sorcerer, but uh, but maybe you allow that an infinite number of uh, of uh, brooms would be okay. Uh, yeah. In the sixteen value two dimensional image that we had before, that started to oscillate between two states. Well, as far as I understood you, the program that you that you used to 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 generate this. Game or uh, this algorithm uh, sticks to its own premises, so it simply works on. But what about uh, errors happening or, or shifting values? So where, where do they come from? Or, or what is about, what about error correction in this stability? So you're, uh, you're talking about shifting values in, in what situation? In, in this uh, diagram, you have the 16 value output. Oh, you mean the up, the up and the down, and they're, and they're shifting back and forth. Yeah. But if you applied the same, if you crossed and then crossed again, you'd be at the, uh, you'd be at the zero, right? Yeah. Um, well, that's just the form of that. Uh, that is the form of that. But then if you go back to the physical situation, well, um, energy can give rise to a pair of fermions. Uh, energy can't give rise to two fermions of the same type. That's Pauli's principle. That's like u, u equals zero. Um, then when will energy give rise to two fermions? Uh, you, don't, you don't actually know. I mean, you, know, you have a description like that, and then in actual physics, we, it, there's just, um, if you know more, know about the physics, you would have some sense of, of the frequency with which uh, pairs would be created. Um, but but, but you, don't have a, you don't have a complete story about when those things will happen in the physics. So you could have. So all I'm saying is, you can have situations where part of it you know about and part of it you don't know about. Time to stop. Thank you.